And so these are images from the museum's uh, digitized archives. Um, very exciting. We, we thought we would go uh, along with this woman in sports theme. And so we have really great images of women from um, Sandy Spring area um, playing tennis. This is a, our theme for uh, these images. Um, and so, as I said, this is because of the museum's digitization project. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can share with you guys um, a link. Here we go. If you are interested in learning any more about the digitization project or what is available, um, you can click this link and go to Digital Maryland. Um, but uh, I wanted to say the museum's official statement. Um, so during these very difficult times that we've experienced as individuals um, and as a country, Sandy Spring Museum too has experienced challenges grappling with the role we play in a system that benefits some at the expense of others. The United States was built on discriminatory practices that were codified in our legal system, beginning with the dehumanization of native people, followed by the enslaving of black people in bondage as property for the financial benefit of those white European, those of white European ancestry. Sandy Spring Museum stands on land that was once a plantation where black people were enslaved. We recognize the museum is the beneficiary of a historical unjust system. We are committed to working towards dismantling systems that perpetuate racism and discrimination in order to build a just and equitable society. We recognize as well that other groups of people have been systematically oppressed, among them are women. Tonight's program is one of many programs that we host that challenges the dominant narrative. And a note on technology. Um, so to increase the accessibility to all of our programs, our virtual programs will now have closed captioning. If you would prefer not to see the closed captioning, please hit the more button at the bottom of your screen and click hide subtitles. Uh, also, if everyone could please mute their audio, it will provide for uh, better listening for all of our attendees tonight. And my role will be introducing Tom. He will be our moderator for today's really exciting discussion and talk. Um, and so Tom O'Toole retired last February after 43 years uh, in sports journalism. The last 20 years were at USA Today, where he was college sports editor and then senior editor in charge of, among other things, uh, the NFL and college sports. He also worked at Scripps Howard News Service, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. A 1978 graduate of Wake Forest University, he has covered 14 Olympic games, 18 Final Fours, as well as Wimbledon, the Masters, Super Bowls, and World Series. He and his wife, Jean, have three children. And now to hand it over to Tom so he can introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Leslie, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I should say my wife is also a board member at uh, Sandy Spring Museum. There are few, if any, more accomplished and versatile sports journalists in the US than Christine Brennan. In addition to being an award-winning columnist for USA Today, she is the alphabet soup of commentators, appearing on CNN, ABC, PBS, NPR, and even WTOP. A graduate of Northwestern University and a native of Toledo, Ohio, she has authored seven books. Her 1996 national bestseller on figure skating, Inside Edge, was named one of the top 100 sports books of all time by Sports Illustrated. She has covered the last 19 Olympic games and in less than two months will be on her way to China for her 20th. She has blazed many trails for women in the profession, including first woman sports writer at the Miami Herald, first woman to cover the Washington football team as a staff writer at the Washington Post, first president of the Association for Women in Sports Media, where she started an internship scholarship program that has supported 175 female students over the past two decades. In March, 2020, Chris was honored with the prestigious Red Smith Award, presented annually to a person who has made major contributions to sports journalism. Those of us in the sports writing world know how significant that award is. One announcement before we start, if you would like to ask Christine questions, please put them in the Zoom chat and I will relay them. I learn something every time I talk with her, and tonight you will too. So with that, I'm very excited and pleased to welcome to the Sandy Spring Museum, someone who's been a colleague and who is a friend of 30 years, Christine Brennan. 
Thank you, Tom. Thank you that, for the lovely introduction and, and right back at you in terms of uh, there's no better editor, no better friend, and just a journalist, journalist, um, a pros pro, Tom O'Toole. So, um, you know, if I, if I keel over in the next minute and a half, Tom will be just fine on his own for the next 45 minutes or an hour. Hopefully I will not keel over, but um, you couldn't uh, have a better moderator uh, and uh, a better person than Tom O'Toole. So Tom, thank you. And hello to the, the O'Toole family and of course others who are here. It's really great to be here. And thank you, Leslie, of course, for, for having us. Um, and I guess, Tom, we're just going to chat for a few minutes, just get things rolling and then... Uh, and then I'll kind of charge off for a little bit talking about women in sports and where we are. And then as, as Tom and I discussed the other day, uh, questions are great. Uh, I want this, we want this to be a dialogue and, and have you uh, have the opportunity to ask anything you'd like and, and everything's on the record. Uh, we're journalists, so we want people to be on the record. So of course, anything goes here, uh, nothing is off the table for sure. So Tom, how are we? Uh, how are we kicking this off? Well, the first thing I wanted to do was ask you about something that has uh, been in the news quite a bit lately, and that's college coaching salaries. You know, just look at the deals Brian Kelly at LSU and Mel Tucker at Michigan State signed for around hundred million dollars each. But back in October, South Carolina women's basketball coach Don Staley signed a contract worth twenty-two point four million over seven years. Puts her on par with UConn's Gino Ariema, who's the highest-paid coach in women's basketball. There's about a dozen women's coaches who make a million a year, including Maryland's Brenda Fries. But that said, the highest paid men's basketball coaches will bring in seven to eight million dollars a year. And according to USA Today, I had to get that plug in. There are now there are now 34 college football assistant coaches making more than a million a year. When Dawn signed her contract, she called it one of the most progressive decisions South Carolina has ever made. It said, in the midst of all our inequities in our country, I hope it's a turning point. So my question to you is, do you really think this is a turning point? Should the turning point have happened a while ago? And where are we in the, the realm of uh, pay for, for coaches and college athletics? You know, Tom, it's a great starting point and, and because it is newsworthy. And, and I'm going to guess a lot of, uh, of, of us here on the, on the uh, Zoom have not really paid much attention to that. But uh, Don Staley having a $22 million contract over seven years uh, to coach basketball, women's basketball in South Carolina, where she's won a national championship. She also was the coach of the U.S. Olympic team, the women's basketball team uh, in Tokyo, winning the gold as they've won everything since 1996. Uh, gold medals they haven't lost since uh, 92, the U.S. women's basketball team. So Dawn Staley was the latest head coach to win a gold medal. Um, but uh, it is it is a very significant development. Is it going to be the norm? I'm afraid not. Uh, I think I, I think there's more money in women's sports than ever before. Today is the greatest day in women's sports until tomorrow. <laughs> and I say that also about girls sports. If for those of you who have granddaughters maybe playing sports or the girl next door you cheer for or whatever, um, it truly is amazing the changes with women's sports and where we've come with Title IX and which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about uh, as it nears its 50th anniversary. Uh, but I, I just, I, I'm hoping that it nudges other schools to pay attention. Uh, and as we know, and you know, from covering college sports so long in your career, that it, it's an arms race. There is that element of arms race. And that's why, you know, Nick Saban makes this and Brian Kelly makes this and Mel Tucker makes this. And, and it's just, it, it doesn't stop. It's not going down. So there, that's the good news, right? That, that Don Staley, they've now set that. Uh, marker out there, but I still think there are a lot of programs that won't come anywhere near reaching it for a long time. And of course, Don Staley deserves it and more because she's so darn successful. I don't know. What what do you make of the situation? I, I think like you, I, I don't know that it's a turning point. I think, you know, it's, uh, I'd be hesitant to say many coaches are going to make that kind of money. I mean, look how long it took her to match Gino. gino has been making some money for a while. And then, you know, Pat Summit, I guess, was really the breakthrough with some of the money too, but it's three coaches out of 300 and some division one schools. So anyway, with that, I will turn it over to you and uh, we're on our way. Thank you. Well, it was a perfect kickoff because the idea of where we are with women's sports now compared to where we once were, I think is extraordinary. And, and as I said, um, as Tom said too, of course, please, any questions you have, uh, put them in the chat. 
frankly, if you just want to hit the thing to raise your hand, Tom will call on you and, and we can <laughs> and have a wonderful conversation, which is what I really uh, hope this will be uh, for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes or so. And then we'll certainly open up to questions if, if, you, uh, if we haven't had any to this point. Um, it, we it really have come a long way. And when you look at those pictures that you started with, <laughs> uh, which I can't wait to come and see uh, at some point, because those old pictures of women trying to play sports in long dresses, we see that with tennis all the time, old Wimbledon photos, um, bloomers, my goodness, even into the 30s and 40s and probably the 50s, uh, women were not dressed in anything that would have been appropriate for running and jumping and, and having any kind of athletic success. And of course, for generations, this is what our, our country uh, told women and girls to wear. And, and this was how they looked at women and girls sports. And, you know, when you, when you think of for those generations, basically we were telling girls, you could maybe play tennis or you can maybe, you know, have gym class or, or I remember my mom talked about a club where they'd all play Red Rover and, and play a little basketball back when she was in high school, which was the 1940s. Um, but after that, there was nothing. There was certainly no college scholarships. There were no opportunities. There was the Olympic Games. If you were a swimmer, uh, a runner, uh, obviously other sports started to come in, uh, figure skating, uh, speed skating. But in general, there were no professional opportunities except golf and tennis, the LPGA and the tennis, uh, uh, Women's Tennis Association. Uh, but even that, those were mostly getting going through the 60s and 70s. And uh, the LPGA has been around longer, but in terms of having any kind of a major, be a major force, you know, in the uh, in our in our country, and something that people would talk about uh, or at the water cooler or what have you, uh, it really was the, the opportunities were were so few and far between, and we were basically telling fifty percent of our country, no, you cannot play sports, you cannot learn those life lessons. It's not necessarily about creating Olympic athletes or professional athletes, although that's wonderful, or scholarship, uh, kid, kids that get scholarships for college, which of course now women do just as men, um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands over the last 10, 20 years. Um, but we were telling all these women, no, you can't get these opportunities. You cannot learn how to win at a young age and even more important, learn, learn how to lose at a young age. Teamwork, sportsmanship, all these things that make our, uh, you a better person. Uh, make you whatever you're going to be, whether you're going to be a, a mom, a doctor, a lawyer, a coach, a, a teacher, any combination thereof, um, you'll be better at it because you played sports. And what in the world were we thinking as a nation that for all those years we were telling girls no? Well, I was very lucky. I was being told yes. Uh, before we knew the term girl dad, uh, my father was a girl dad. And growing up in Toledo in the 60s and 70s, I'm the oldest of four kids and I was, my mom jokes, I was born size six X and kept right on growing. I'm 5'11", 5'11 and a half uh, now. And so here their oldest child wants to play sports and she happens to be a girl. And my dad is playing catch with me in the front yard. And, and I wanted a baseball mitt for my birthday and he got it for me when I was eight. I previously had used one of his old mitts. And the, the boys in the neighborhood and some girls came over and we all had baseball games with my dad, the biggest kid in the block. And, you know, if my parents were concerned, you know, what, what in the world was happening at the Brennan household, uh, which maybe was going on because it was just so unusual. Uh, girls were told to go play with dolls and I was playing with, you know, baseball, football, you know, basketballs, whatever. Um, my mom and dad didn't care. They just wanted to encourage me uh, to do whatever I wanted. And sports was my thing. And, and that's the opportunity that I had. So few women my age, as you know, Tom, as we all know, so few women my age uh, had that opportunity. Uh, as I said, most girls uh, in the 60s, 70s, obviously before then, but 60s and 70s were being told, no, you cannot play sports. And that when you think of that, the missed opportunities for those girls to then grow into women who would be leaders in ways that maybe they, they never had that opportunity uh, and how that would have benefited the country. I actually kind of wave the flag when I start talking about Title IX because it makes the United States a stronger country. Uh, I think there's like two guys out there now who still hate Title IX. I think they're hiding under a desk somewhere in Wyoming. And they can come on out now because it's over, <laughs> uh, because Title IX is here to stay. That is the law, of course, signed by Richard Nixon in June of 1972. 
that mandated that girls and women should have the same proportional opportunities that boys and men to play sports in high school and college, federally funded uh, universities, which basically everyone gets federal funding. And that opened the floodgates. And we can really mark time from that day, which will 50th anniversary, you're gonna hear a lot about that. And we can talk more about it if you'd like. Um, I'm already on, on conference calls and Zoom calls, planning uh, events and um, uh, conferences, whatever, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX, which as I said, is going to be June 23rd of 2022. Uh, it's gonna be a very, very big deal. Uh, and yet for the first 20 years or so, Title IX was mostly ignored. I mean, you had football coaches, you know, saying, well, we're not going to give girls and women opportunities at, at our school. Bo Schembechler, the great, late, great Michigan football coach, when he was the athletic director at Michigan, um, he said that women did not, the female athletes at Michigan did not deserve the same size letter M as his football players. And people wonder why we needed Title IX. <laughs> uh, these, these old time coaches uh, really did not want women to have opportunities. And, but it was the law of the land. And, and what happened was uh, there would be programs around the country where women were not, you know, they're, they're, the coach's office was a closet or the times to practice were terrible compared to the men's times. Uh, the game times were, you know, Tuesday afternoons at three versus the boys uh, in high school got to play at seven o'clock Friday night. I'm sure we're all remembering some of those days. And what happened was parents and, and some of these young athletes um, said enough is enough and they sued. And every single lawsuit uh, where, <laughs> where they used Title IX uh, to fight for equality, every single one they won. There's a concept, equality in America, right? <laughs> and, and so even as athletic directors were being dragged kicking and screaming into the 20th century, the latter part of the 20th century, you had moms and dads, and especially dads, fighting hard for their daughters to play sports. And if you talk to Billie Jean King, of course, one of the great icons and someone I've gotten to know very well and, and uh, actually wrote a book with, uh, a self-help book, uh, Pressure is a Privilege, back in 2008. You talk to Billie Jean King and she says, the greatest feminists out there are the dads who have daughters who demand that their daughters have the same opportunities as they had when they were in high school or college. Because the dads know, right? The dads know what uh, their, their daughters are missing. The moms, now a 40 year old mom will know, but a, a woman who's 60 now wouldn't necessarily have had that experience. And so it's the dads, interestingly, who've got their daughters out there getting pitching coaches in sixth grade in Alabama or Mississippi or, or Oregon, and, and really red states as well as blue states have just fallen in love with Title IX. Uh, I don't see anything there politically. Um, it's, it is really uh, one of the most universally loved laws and I believe the most important law in our country over the last 50 years. And I realize there's a lot of competition, as I said, for that, but uh, truly so important. And why? Why is it so important? And why is it the bedrock really of this entire conversation we're having? It's really the foundation of everything we're talking about here. Um, it, it's because of the what, what we're teaching our daughters and our granddaughters and our nieces and the girl next door. And what we're going to see, I believe, we're already seeing it in the country, but we're gonna to continue to see. Um, I believe throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond, hard to believe, you know, you think about the 50s or the 60s and we're not talking about the 1950s or 60s, but the 2050s or 60s, women are gonna be running for president every time. We've already seen, obviously that. We have, we have a, a woman, uh, Kamala Harris, of course, vice president of the United States. Um, we had other women running for president, of course. And, but I think it's just going to become the norm and women will be president in the, not the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Women running for Congress, we already see those massive numbers, the Senate, uh, women running universities as presidents, uh, that is continuing. Obviously women, doctors, uh, med schools are now more women than men. Uh, law schools, many law schools now are, have more women than men as students. Um, obviously corporations, CEOs, what have you. And I believe that the common denominator for all these women will be that they played sports because of Title IX. 
And again, it's not that they were Olympians. It's not that they were even college athletes. It's that they had that opportunity to learn how to win and lose at a young age that their brothers and, and boys and men had for generations before them that now they're getting that chance. And how does it manifest itself? Where do we see this? I can talk about this until I'm blue in the face and you can say, okay, well, show me proof. Well, I assume all of you watched a little bit of the Tokyo Olympics that happened a few months ago. Or, you know, I'm sure you saw some of that, but even going back five years before that, the Rio Olympics, the Summer Olympics in Rio, or before that, the London Olympics in 2012, or before that, the Beijing Olympics in 2008. And in every single one of those Olympic games, US women won more gold medals and more medals overall than US men. I, it's a stunning statistic. Four Olympics in a row, more medals, more of the medals won by the United States were won by women than men. And for the last three Olympic, summer Olympic games I'm talking about here, women, there've been more women on the US team than men. Uh, London, Rio, and Tokyo. Now, why is that? In some cases, it's because unfortunately the men, uh, men's failure in the case of soccer, the men have not, the US men have not uh, qualified for the Olympic team. That would have added 18, what, 20 players, 20, 20 athletes. Um, but even then, uh, just the numbers are there for the women. And then of course the success, you know, led by any number of people, Simone Biles, Katie Ledecky, uh, of course, the teams, the women's basketball team I mentioned a little bit ago, women's soccer team, uh, on and on it goes. Uh, of course, track and field athletes as well. And uh, Allison Felix is a name, of course, that comes to mind that you probably know. And, and these women are denied opportunities for the most part to be professionals in other areas. Whereas of course, men, our best male athletes may well be in the NFL or the NBA, which the NBA does we do have a, a basketball team that goes in the men's team to the Olympics as well, but, uh, or baseball, which you also can have had baseballs now back in the Olympics, but that's uh, college age as opposed to pro. So our best male athletes are probably playing other sports, but for women, the Olympic games are the Super Bowl. They are the world series. And Katie Ledecky might've been a great free safety <laughs> and won many Super Bowls, if there was such a thing as women's football and, and a women's Super Bowl, obviously there isn't, it would be, you know, this a ridiculous concept, right? So Katie Ledecky is, of course, a great swimmer, and thank goodness she has the form she has uh, to be that athlete, obviously, from the area here, from Bethesda, and such a great role model and such a wonderful person. I've known her for a long time and, and just a, a terrific human being, as, as modest and kind in victory as any athlete we have ever seen in any sport, uh, preferring to talk about someone else, even as she's got all these gold medals hanging around her neck, talk about her competitors, praise her competitors, her teammates for coming in second or third or fourth uh, and cheering for them as much as uh, other people are cheering for her. But uh, again, that's the opportunity we've given these women. It's there, the Olympics, and they're dominating. So again, those two guys hiding under the desk in Wyoming that I just made up, you know, the idea that the last two people who hate Title IX, those old Neanderthals out there that somehow don't want women to do any of this stuff. Well, if they turned on the Olympics at any point over the last four summer Olympics and cheered for the US for even one minute, then they love Title IX because Title IX has delivered uh, so many successes and so much joy for US sports fans waving their red, white, and blue and cheering for US women. That is Title IX. And, and you can really go back, I'm sure many of you remember the 1999 Women's World Cup, um, which interestingly falls basically at the halfway point of these 50 years of Title IX. Uh, of course, again, 1972 is Title IX. And 1999, 27 years later, is the Women's World Cup. That beautiful day, July 10th, 1999, in the Rose Bowl, filled to capacity with dads and their daughters cheering on uh, this women's soccer team. And, and then it's, of course, that will be 23 years after that to this 50th anniversary. So sandwiched right there in the middle. And uh, what we saw then, I think, was the most uh, well, remarkable moment uh, in terms of uh, realizing that the nation had fallen in love with what it had created with Title IX. Uh, when we saw those packed stadiums, and one of my favorite stories of all, I covered all of that, uh, and I couldn't wait to, to get out to those games and as that story just developed and, and just exploded as the nation, as I said, fell in love with this team. Uh, the first game was at the Meadowlands in New Jersey, and they're on a bus, the team is on the bus, and they're stuck in traffic. 
and they see all these cars and all this, and they're like, what the heck is going on here? Why, why is traffic so bad? And within a few minutes, they realized all those people were there for them. Uh, the crowd at the Meadowlands, it was bigger than a New York Jets playoff game. More people showed up for a women's soccer game than a New York Jets playoff game that had been, what, six months earlier. And only the Pope had more people ever attend a, a game in that stadium than that opening game against uh, Denmark uh, in the summer of 99. And it just built from there. Uh, and it was really a minivan revolution, moms and dads and their daughters. And... Um, was remarkable. And I think it showed a lot of those naysayers how big a deal Title IX is and how much, as I said, the nation had fallen in love with what it had created. The girl next door was now on the cover of Time, Newsweek, People, Sports Illustrated. And by the way, it's a little fact for your next dinner party or your next cocktail party, whenever, whenever we're all going to have those again. Um, that is the only story in the history of stories, the Women's World Cup soccer team, Brandi Chastain, Mia Hamm, Brianna Scurry making that incredible save to make it all possible. Uh, the only team and the only story in the history of any story that I've been able to ever dig up that made the cover of Time, Newsweek, People, and Sports Illustrated in the same week. It's easy to do Time and Newsweek back in the day. They had Sports Illustrated, okay. Um, but People magazine too. So uh, it truly was a remarkable uh, few weeks in America. And it's not just sports, it's our cultural history. In fact, it is just American history to see where we've gone with this and how uh, the women leaders of today and tomorrow are being built on the playing fields that we drive by. And you know, think about that too. If you've driven by a field 20 or 30 years ago, you, uh, if you've let's make it more like 30 or 40 years ago. And you saw a girl out on that playing field. She was probably there telling her brother he'd come, it was time to come home for dinner. And now you don't give it a second thought, do you? As you're driving in your neighborhood or by a school and you see a team of all girls or all women uh, practicing lacrosse, field hockey, soccer, rugby, uh, whatever. You don't even take a second look. And that is how ingrained this has become in our society and how much uh, we not only love, but expect girls and women to have those opportunities that, and that for generations only boys and men had. Um, certainly there are uh, issues yet in terms of uh, women's sports and where, where, it, where it's been, where it's going. Uh, Tom, of course, alluded to it with just talking about salaries. Women's sports are nowhere near making the kind of money that men's sports are, except in tennis. Uh, where you can find in some years, if you look at the season ending uh, money list, you'll see uh, that a, a, a woman's tennis player may well make more as much, if not more than a male tennis player. Um, the prize money is equal. All four of the grand slams are equal. The last was Wimbledon. Venus Williams took the torch from Billie Jean King and fought for that. Uh, but the US Open, um, thanks to Billie Jean King, started paying, paying equal prize money in 1973. I'm pretty sure it was 73. It was right around there. And um, can you imagine the U.S. Open tennis equal pay for men and women in 1973? Took Wimbledon until 2005 or 2006. So that shows you what the impact that Billie Jean King had uh, and the fight for equality. Um, but but there are still there there's still many many. Uh, success is yet to come. I prefer to look at it that way, the glass half full rather than uh, half empty. But uh, certainly in urban and underserved areas, we have not reached those girls and those young women uh, the way we have in the suburbs. And um, it, that is a real issue. Obviously, a lot of that is finances. A lot of it is just uh, city schools that don't have the finances that are strapped uh, that don't have the ability to hire the coaches that suburban schools do. Uh, obviously, uh, you could make a strong case that suburban parents may have the finances to then put their girls and their daughters into cl uh, club or travel teams the way that underserved communities, whether they be rural or urban, just don't. And that is something that we really have to work on because um, if we're succeeding so greatly for our suburban uh, girls, be they white, black, you know, whatever. Uh, but we're missing uh, those those urban kids who need those opportunities as much, if not more, than their suburban sisters. And then also um, women coaching women. 
I think that's another one that that we kind of, uh, some of you on the call might might be going, yeah, that's right, I've noticed that, right? But others, you might not even think of it. But um, as these jobs have become more desirable, coaching women in college in particular, that's what I'm thinking of here. As these jobs have become plum jobs, uh, more athletic directors who are by and large white men hire, of course, people who look like them, white men, for those jobs. These jobs now all pay in six figures at, at, at power five schools and at, at our big, big conference schools. And they're great jobs to have. So what we've seen, for example, in women's soccer, Title IX, at the time of Title IX, I believe it was 90%, somewhere in the 90% range, women coaching women's soccer at all of our universities back in the 70s. And the latest number I saw a couple of years ago was about 30% now women coaching women's soccer, 70% men. And again, it's probably changing a little. It could be up to 40% women and 60% men. But these jobs are so, so great. The men want them. And the athletic directors are hiring men. So when people like me bring this up and occasionally write about it and talk about it, they say, well, it's just so hard to find women. <laughs> and I'm thinking, do you see these playing fields? Is no one encouraging these girls to grow up to be coaches? And where are the programs, including U.S. soccer? to U.S. soccer should never, and this is not against any guys in the audience. We love men. This is not about male bashing at all. U.S. soccer right now, women's soccer team has a male coach. He's great, fabulous, yay. The greatest best known women's sports team on the planet is coached by a man. That is a terrible message. Nothing against him, but what a message. If we want our daughters and nieces and granddaughters and all these wonderful girls to grow up and have the, the sky's the limit, right? You can play a sport for as long as you want. Probably can't, you know, once you're out of college, you're probably gonna be done. You can certainly play as a, as a you know, a weekend warrior for the rest of your life uh, and they will. Uh, but, you know, as you, as you think about that, what are their options? Well, you can go to med school, you can become an orthopedist, right? You can become a, a doctor, you can be a trainer, you can become a sports agent, you can become a sports administrator, you can become a sports uh, journalist, you can be a member of the media. And so we see so many more women wanting to get into sports media. I, so many women, I don't even know them all, which in the old days, everyone knew everyone. Uh, there were you know, dozens of us. Now there are hundreds, thousands of women covering sports in this country, local, national level. It's unbelievable, the explosion of interest. Almost all of them played sports and then want careers in sports. And then you look and you think about, well, you're being coached by a man, right? If you're a sixth grader, an eighth grader, and a man is coaching you in soccer. Well, what kind of message is that? That means that the message is, uh, well, I guess in coaching, it's going to be a guy. And that is a huge failure. And that's why I strongly believe, even though I understand the argument about quotas and, and all of that stuff, I get it, I get it. But how in the world can the U.S. women's soccer team ever be coached by a man? And yet it is happening right now. And they should never, they should have women in the pipeline. And it's a failure if they don't. They should pluck these great women and say, we're going to get you into coaching jobs and groom you and get you ready and educate and all that you need so that you can then be a women's national team coach and coach the Olympic team or coach the juniors or the 19s team or whatever um, for, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years. And that is a big failure of the national governing body, among others, of course, are the ones that are having this constant pay battle about not paying the women um, what they are worth in soccer. And so no surprise that they, you know, they failed in this area as well. But women coaching women, we have all got to do a better job. And what can you do? I mean, you can certainly bring it up at your high school, you know, and say, why, why is the girls basketball team being coached by a man? Again, it's not bashing the guy. It's saying that men are coached by men. Let's try to have women be coached by women to give our daughters that opportunity to see what it's like to have a woman leading them. Muffet McGraw, if you have a few minutes, Google her, the great Notre Dame coach retired a couple of years ago, just said this beautifully in about three minutes, uh, a three minute little talk at the a Women's Final Four a few years ago about how we need women to be coaching women. And as I said, so that is another huge area where uh, we need to do better on, in, the, in, the, in the wonderful world of Title IX. Another little pet peeve, I'll throw this out there. How many times do we hear the word lady something, right? 
if you hear the word, uh, if you're watching TV and they're talking about uh, Brenda Fries and her team, the Terrapins, and if you hear the term lady Terrapins, will you please like email that TV station immediately? They're not the lady Terrapins. <laughs> they're the Terrapins. You go to Maryland, you're a Terrapin. Because is it the gentleman Terrapins? Of course not. And the great, late, great Pat Summit, who was terrific, um, called her team the Lady Vols. When she started that in the 70s, it made sense. She wanted to distinguish her team, her women's basketball team, from the men's team. Doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, most news organizations use the word men's basketball and women's basketball. USA Today, it is mandated. It's a fight that a lot uh, uh, something we've been cheering for for years. And, it, and our, our wonderful sports editor, managing editor for sports, Roxana Scott, um, uh, had that happen. Tom, of course, a dear friend of Roxana as, as I am. Uh, and she's a great leader. And she's now, we do, of course, say men's basketball and women's basketball. It's not just basketball and then, oh, women's basketball, right? As if the, that adjective men's isn't needed, you know, the real one is men's and then, oh, here's the, you know, we'll tap the women on the head and you little sweet things over there. You get to have the adjective women's, no. So USA Today is doing that. I think the New York Times is doing it. You hear it more and more and see it more and more. Even the crawl on ESPN, something I worked hard on on that one too. Um, it used to have B-ball and WB-ball. And um, finally they added the M. M. And these are little things. And, and some of you might be saying, really, you're gonna fight these battles? Yeah. I sure am. Um, little things mean a lot. Uh, details well, Chris, matter. I, my father taught me that. Sorry, Tom. Chris, as, as long as you brought that up, and in fact, Roxana's on the call, I can see that. Uh, yes, I see her there too. The, uh, <laughs> the NCAA Final Fours have just gone through this because of an embarrassing situation last year during the uh, pandemic when they all went to one one spot to have the games and they had that laughable weight room for the women. And now they are, the, the NCAA itself is going to be calling the men's championship the women's championship because it used to be the women's championship and the NCAA championship. What took so long to get uh, some of the inequities in, in the tournament going? Was it the lack of the media yelling about it where people didn't care? Or did it take something like actually having all the teams in the one spot, you could visit, you know, visually see every all the differences. What what do you think happened there? Yeah, you know, it's it's a, a fascinating question, and um, I I think it was media not making a big deal about it, um, and it's understandable. I mean, again, I, I cannot stress to all of you what a terrific colleague and wonderful sports journalist Tom is. And you know, there's more coming here. And that is that, again, not to, to bash the guys, but most sports writers are men who probably aren't thinking about this and that's okay. And we're, it was always basketball, right? I mean, Tom, you and I for years just said, oh, the, the, the final four. And, and that was just our normal way of talking. It wasn't meant to be discriminatory, right? It was just, well, there's the final four. And of course it's been around longer as have all men's sports been around longer, which is when people say, well, why don't women's sports get the ratings or the attendance? Well, they're, you know, if this is a, a starting line, you know, the men are at this 80 meter mark and the hundred meter dash and the women are basically, you know, at the 10 or 15 meter mark. So, you know, it's really not fair to even compare um, because women are just, you know, just getting going. A lot of the women's, you know, the WNBA is really still very, very new compared to the NBA. Um, but uh, I think just, it was just natural kind of conversation. I was like, that's the final four. And then because the women's final four started in 1982, prior to that, it was the AIAW running its basketball tournaments, um, championships, and then the NCAA took over in 1982. And the men had been going since what, the third, 30s? Uh, when was the first men's final four, Tom? In the late 30s, I think, oh, maybe? Yeah, I, I think so. Well, they, they, had, they had the NIT first, then they evolved into the NCAA, but I think, yeah. It was, yeah, it's, so let's put it that way. 30s, 40s, right. And then again, the women, 82, making the point that we're trying, that we're all making here, of course, about it's still relatively new. So you've got the final four, that's what it's been called, and then here come the women. And so it, it's natural that it would take a while. But the NCAA, Tom, I did a 
column with Miles Brand, who was a wonderful man. He mm -hmm. was the uh, president of Indiana, and then he was in charge of the president of the NCAA. And uh, he passed away of uh, cancer, maybe what, 15 years ago now. Yeah. Um, and I remember asking him because it was, I asked, why aren't you calling the final four, the men's final four? So it's at least 15 years ago. And I'm not sure if anyone else ever asked him and I'm not saying, oh, because whatever. I mean, it's just someone should have. And so, you know, I did and maybe others had, I, I don't know. But he said, well, it's trademarked final four. And again, Miles Brand was, you know, I, I thought it was a very, he's the guy that bo fired Bobby Knight. So, you know, you got to give him his props for that, right? And um, and I said, wait a minute, so it's trademark Final Four. Well, why don't you get a new trademark and call it Men's Final Four? And then, of course, by the way, everyone has to buy all the new stuff, right? The new t-shirts, the new hats. And he goes, oh, yeah, we should, yeah, yeah. Of course, I didn't do anything about it. Um, and I, I, I understand trademark. Well, I understand it's just not easy ripping things up and starting over, but they didn't care. Let's just be honest. They didn't care. They didn't want to touch that. So I don't, I'm assuming everyone remembers, but just a quick refresher, uh, the Oregon women's basketball players, a couple of them, uh, put pictures on Instagram during the tournament time, uh, men's and women's tournaments happening at the same time, obviously quarantined all in one place. Um, a very unique diff during, obviously during this, uh, you know, right at the height of the pandemic. Um, and the Oregon women's basketball players showed, took pictures of what they said was the weight room. It was a couple uh, dumbbells and I think a few mats and I think um, just a little like something, a little stand for the weights or something like that. And then of course, my media members seeing this and others seeing it too, other people on Instagram, then showed what the men had. And it was, you know, it was as far as the eye could see, a uh, spectacular state-of-the-art workout area and weight room. And, and this, of course, is unusual because you would normally have all these different sites. You wouldn't have one weight room, but because everyone was focused in, in, and consolidated in one place, there you could see the difference in the two weight rooms. And this just became viral and it became national news. And I was doing a ton of stuff of, uh, with USA Today, but also with uh, CNN and ABC on it. And it just caught fire and people really cared. And the pictures told the story. And this forced over a few, what, conversation over what, a couple of weeks and then into the few months uh, that the, uh, that, and for some reason, the NCA was not including women in its contracts with March Madness in all the, the sponsorship deals. March Madness now covers women's basketball as well as men. Why it took this, who knows, but it did. Old Boys Network, you know, things take a, take a long time. And, uh, and then the word Final Four is now going to be used on the women's tournament, on, on the floor when you look at the game and you see the, the big uh, logo at, at midcourt uh, will now be used. So it took that to have some semblance of equality. And, you know, you get people fighting back, Tom, you know this well, I'm sure you dealt with readers like, well, no one cares about women's basketball, right? And we care about men's and the TV ratings. And it's like, there are so many reasons to do the right thing that have nothing to do with eyeballs or TV ratings. Uh, it, it's called equality. You have women playing basketball and men playing basketball. And by the way, if you include the women in this very high level way, giving them the lift, of having the title Final Four and having these sponsorship deals, you in fact will increase interest in women's basketball. Funny thought. And already all of those, a lot of those uh, women's basketball players have huge Instagram followings and the name, image and likeness conversation, which is a whole different conversation we can get into or not, but women athletes are, are really doing great in that because they've got these following the women's gymnasts, not only the Olympians, but college gymnasts. Um, they have great Instagram following, social media followings, and, and companies want to attach themselves to that. So what surprisingly, once you open that door and you start to see what the opportunities are, uh, the NCAA and others, the media have realized that there is a strong market for women's basketball and it's about time, but let's In never fact, call them um, lady, whatever. Right. In fact, there are um, two sisters from Fresno State who play women's basketball signed some of the earliest and, and most lucrative deals when uh, when the legislation changed. As long as you brought up uh, ratings, I was going to ask you about that, too. How do you fight the perception that no one 
wants to watch women's sports because every Olympics, figure skating is usually the highest rated uh, sport at the Winter Olympics. Women's gymnastics, if not the highest, then the, one of the highest in, in the Summer Olympics. You had the Women's Soccer uh, Championship this fall beating expectations in terms of ratings and crowds. You referenced the crowds at the World Cup before. It seems as though the perception is there, but when people start looking at the numbers, it's always better that, than, than you would think. But you still can't escape the, uh, what you said earlier that nobody wants to watch women's sports. Yeah, you know these things take time. I, I think um, any woman on the uh, on the Zoom knows that, and and men too, like you, like you, Tom, who are um, obviously you get it, and you have daughters. You and Jean have daughters, and and uh, you know uh, you you want the best for anyone. Um, sometimes these things take time, and sponsors are set in their ways. Um, as an aside, we certainly see that with sponsors of the IOC and the Olympics, right? Who are not going to fight for um, human the, the rights of you know the, in in China and and fight these human rights violations? They're just lockstep with the IOC. Coca Cola, let's sell more Cokes in in Beijing, and and uh, 1.4 billion Chinese want to have their Big Macs, and so they're all in these companies. Um, so they they you know why are we doing it? Because we've always done it this way. I do think though that social media, which is is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, we know the negatives about social media and, and uh, the concerns for kids and, and young women and young men uh, spending too much time and dealing with all those issues. But the positives here is if the mainstream media is ignoring it, which unfortunately a lot of our, our, our colleagues in sports media, Tom, over the years have, have ignored women's sports or not, you know, not, just, I don't want to cover it or, you know, we're going to, we don't have the budget to cover the women's basketball team at at a university like we cover the men's or whatever those things might be, um, th that women are able to have the avenues themselves to be seen and heard as, as this Oregon example with the women's quote unquote weight room uh, and that scandal that ensued that became just a huge nationwide story. So they can go with that. They can just uh, promote themselves. And I think, you know, especially more untraditional sponsors, right? The ones that aren't tied in to the major commercial deals and what have you, um, they are much more nimble and they can say, hey, let's just let's just go and look at these numbers on these Instagram accounts and let's start to pay these young people. And I think we're gonna see more innovative um, advertisers. Uh, we already are seeing some of that. Uh, think of even the Super Bowl commercials. What did we see of women 30 years ago? Scantily clad women wandering around with, you know, Diet Cokes or, you know, whatever the heck they were doing. Um, now you see Serena, you know, who I, I can't believe I've gone this far and haven't really mentioned Serena Williams, one of the greatest of all time. I mean, think about Serena. I, she's just terrific. The greatest tennis player ever, I believe, uh, male or female. Um, just a great role model. And a, as a mom, working mom, um, Serena is all over the place. And you think about body image and what we used to think would sell products, right? Um, a, a beautiful, thin model, a, you know, off, terribly thin model, white woman, of course, right? Um, you know, as someone who's uh, almost six feet tall and was was never a, a little girl, I look at Serena and you see the, the muscles and that power, and that is now something that Madison Avenue wants in a huge way. And by the way, it's also a black woman. I mean, we really have come a long way and Serena has helped us come a long way. I mean, obviously this just didn't happen. Her incredible ability uh, to win and to be such a great role model and such an interesting person and so smart and, and everything about her as a champion uh, has made this happen, um, but there she is. And so it is happening. We are watching it happen. Um, but it's slow. And I think a lot, I think for, if any, again, if anyone says, what can we do? If you see an ad that you think is sexist or you see just a, a big boys club ad or something going on and you, or, you know, whatever, uh, write to that company, let them know you didn't like that. And I, I know people have said this over the years. I'm sure you, Tom, you've dealt with this. Well, like, oh, what does one email do or one letter or one phone call? Well, 
it means a lot because most people don't ever do that. And I know you can also tweet at them, right? And say, hey, at State Farm, <laughs> what are you doing with this clown Aaron Rodgers? You know, um, uh, which is a whole other story. But I mean, you can reach those companies. You as consumers can tell them if you like what they're doing with women's sports, which a lot of them are doing a nice job now. Uh, and if you don't, you can let them know and they'll know you're out there and you have a voice. And I'm not saying you have to, but I think that is one option. Um, it's not just to throw something at the TV or kick the dog <laughs> and go, gosh, darn it, we still have a long way to go. You can actually let them know you're out there. So just a thought there. Yeah, Chris, uh, we'll try to get a few questions in here. Uh, we, have, we have one question about your thoughts on the WTA and its response to uh, pulling its tournaments in China after the tennis player was uh, kind of disappeared. And the, of course, the IOC uh, comes off looking pretty bad in this too. WT, what's your impression of what the WTA did? And that's the Women's Tennis Association for, if you don't know that, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I think the WTA has put on a masterclass in humanitarian leadership, uh, in leadership for our times, in uh, concern over uh, equality for women, and of course, concern over Me Too, because at the end of the day, the Peng Shui story is the world's biggest Me Too story. I'm sure you all know this, but just in a sentence or two, she went on um, Chinese Twitter uh, on November 2nd saying that a top former Chinese official uh, raped her, sexually assaulted her. And she put that on, on social media in China. Within 20 minutes, it was gone. She, she was wiped off of the internet, as was any mention even of tennis, uh, as China censored her. And for a couple of weeks, there was real concern about where she was, Peng Shui. She was a former um, number one ranked doubles player, ranked 15th in singles at her best in the mid, I think it was like 2014 or 2015, and has won a couple of Grand Slams, I believe, at least I think two in doubles. A great, great tennis player and very popular tennis player. And all of a sudden there was the hashtag, where is Peng Shui and Chris Everett, Billie Jean King, Serena, everyone was, you know, where is she? forcing the Chinese government to start putting out these pictures and a statement that sounded like something right out of the airplane movie with, you know, a, a joke about some, you know, somebody that's being told to say something. I mean, it's not funny at all, but it was ridiculous. And, um, and the WTA, Steve Simon, the CEO, if you haven't followed this, look him up, uh, you know, Google him, Steve Simon, CEO. He belongs on the Mount Rushmore of sports leaders forever. This man has literally gone to bat for Peng Shui, for women everywhere. He is just uh, literally looking at China as a bully and popping them in the nose. And he keeps doing it. And all these companies for years, I alluded to 2008 uh, Beijing Olympics, where these companies just wilt. Oh, China. Okay, sure. Go ahead and abuse everybody. Well, we still want to be a sponsor. And the WTA just put on that masterclass of how to stop this, of how to say enough is enough to China. And, and then as you alluded to, Tom, as the question uh, alluded to, um, the WTA said, we're considering taking our business from China. That's up to 10 tournaments, uh, close to, a, it's believed to be a billion dollars in, in revenue. Uh, and then sure enough, about a week ago, Steve Simon did it. He said, we are pulling all of our tennis tournaments out of China. If the International Olympic Committee had done this back in 02, 03, 04, before the Beijing Olympics, which were 08, they give the Olympics seven years in advance, if, if the IOC, which it said it would and didn't, if it had said, China, clean up your act on human rights abuses, or we're going to give the Olympics to Sydney or Los Angeles or LA or someone, threaten them, really threaten them the way the WTA has just done it. Um, I think the human rights violations in China would have been cleaned up because China, it was the greatest gift China ever had, the Olympic Games. And instead, the IOC blew it in 2008. And of course, they've blown it again, because now, of course, the, 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 some, the Winter Olympics will be in Beijing, only because Norway pulled out. It was supposed to be in Norway in 2022. And then the IOC had to go to Beijing because they didn't have a, a, a really good option otherwise. And they've given this, this awful repressive government uh, another Olympic Games. And, um, and it, but interestingly, so the IOC gets involved with Peng Shui because she's a three-time Olympian. And the IOC is in bed, of course, business partners with Beijing and China because of the Olympics coming up. 
they hold this, this call where they have a screenshot. That's all we see. You don't see the video of Feng Shui's room to see if someone's there coerce, coercing her with a gun or who knows what, threatening her. Um, you don't get a chance to hear her voice. Uh, there's no mention of Me Too. IOC's done now two calls and two statements and then one press conference. Never talking about Me Too. Never. I've asked them about it continually. I will con continue to bother them and and uh, ask you and send emails um, pummeling them on that topic. And the IOC did not allow the WTA and Steve Simon, who has been leading the way on this, on those calls. And that's why you've seen the, the IOC receiving intense worldwide criticism. I think they're reeling. China is reeling. And the WTA is standing there tall and proud as just a wonderful leader in how to fight for an athlete, in this case, a woman, fight for Me Too, fight for women and equality and human rights for all. And uh, uh, it's fascinating and it's gonna go all the way to the Winter Olympics. Um, guaranteed, we will be discussing this story. Athletes will be speaking out, they'll win a gold medal at the Olympics and then they'll talk about Peng Shui and China's gonna have to censor the whole thing. And it's gonna be a, a real embarrassment for China. And I promise you, I will be talking about this and writing about it until China cuts off my internet and then I'll send I, smoke signals. <laughs> I have no doubt you will do that in little less than two months. Uh, Leslie, I think, are we about done or do we have any more time? Yeah, um, I wanna give anybody else a chance to ask a question um, before we wrap up, we are about time. Does anybody else have a, a, a last question they wanna ask Christine? Okay, um, well, yeah, I will just say thank you so, so much, Christine, for for uh, speaking to all of us today. I learned a lot. I didn't, um, as somebody who played uh, basketball and track um, in high school, I didn't realize the importance of Title IX in my life until you talked about it today. So thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, the History Happy Hours will continue in 2022. I can't believe we're almost there. Um, they'll continue again in January. Um, but before then, I hope you all stop by the museum for the holiday gift show. It is up until December 22nd. Um, but I hope you enjoyed tonight's program as much as I did. And then I'll let you all go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.